Well, good afternoon, and welcome to this installment of our Scripture and Ministry Lecture Series, sponsored by the Carl F. H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Very pleased that you are all with us. Uh, we're especially pleased that Reverend Alistair Begg is with us today, and we are looking forward to hearing him. He's been in pastoral ministry since 1975. Following graduation from the London School of Theology, he served eight years in Scotland at both Charlotte Chapel in Edinburgh and Hamilton Baptist Church. In 1983, he became the senior pastor at Parkside Church near Cleveland, Ohio. He's written several books, and he is heard daily and weekly on the radio program Truth for Life. The teaching on Truth for Life stems from the week-by-week -week Bible teaching at Parkside Church. And he and his wife, Susan, were married in 1975 and have three grown children. We're pleased that he is with us today. And we're honored that you are all with us today. And we are, of course, honored to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit today. Let's pray for the Lord's blessing on this time together. Lord, we give you thanks for this day and your mercies new each day. We give you thanks for this time together, for the truth that you give us in your word, for your grace which surrounds and sustains us, and for this opportunity to learn of you and your way and your works in our world. We ask for your blessing on Reverend Begg and upon each of us as we hear and receive. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you very much. It is uh, a privilege to be invited to uh, deliver this lecture in the Scripture and Ministry series, a lecture that I've entitled uh, Inadequacy, The Surprising Secret to Being Useful to God. And I think you would understand if I said that I feel myself entirely inadequate to give a lecture on the subject. But I want to begin by setting a context in the Bible. And if you are able to follow along, I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians and chapter 2, and beginning to read at the 12th verse. And I'm going to read through to the end of verse 6 in chapter 3. And Paul is describing the circumstances. Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ, before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Amen. <clears throat> I want to approach uh, the subject from uh, four perspectives. First of all, uh, to consider 
uh, here in 2 Corinthians, and largely in the section that begins in chapter 10, uh, the biblical framework that underpins the uh, thesis in the title, then to change gears from that and move to the cultural setting, uh, which is ours in seeking to understand the Bible, then to change gears again and to ask a question concerning the contemporary church in relationship to the biblical framework and the cultural setting, and then finally uh, to look at the whole matter uh, in relationship to ourselves as individuals. So I'll try and make uh, my points clear as I go along, uh, looking first of all at it, if you like, biblically. The Oxford English Dictionary, which is the only dictionary that anyone should really pay attention to, uh, defines inadequacy as, quotes, the condition or quality of being inadequate. If you think about that, you look up a dictionary for help, and uh, that's as good as it can do. Perhaps I misspoke in, in commending the dictionary at all. But rather, what it is pointing out is that inadequacy is an indication of being unequal to what a task requires, being unequal to what a task requires. And it is that very issue that in the NIV from which I was reading, uh, Paul addresses at the very end of verse 16 and in a simple sentence when he asks the question, who is equal to such a task? or in the ESV, who is sufficient for these things. What Paul is doing there is he's addressing the issue of adequacy. And his expressions of confidence, particularly in this second letter, are not displays of self-assumption. He freely admits, as you would have noticed towards the end of our reading, that he is unequal to the task in himself, and he makes it perfectly clear that the secret to his usefulness in ministry cannot be traced to any natural competence. So in verse 5, again, not that we are competent or sufficient or adequate in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Now, this is not an aberration on the part of Paul. This is true to his self-designation throughout all of his letters. Classically, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says on that occasion, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. And it is this perspective which underpins Paul's entire understanding, not only of himself, but also of the ministry to which God has called him. And in addressing the Corinthians in his second letter, part of the challenge that he faces is found in responding to those who have opposed him and who accuse him of being cowardly and of being unworldly, of being worldly, I should say, and of being uh, something of a second-class citizen when it comes to the things of Christ. Uh, you must uh, take my word for that and then read chapter 10 and see if what I'm telling you is true. And if you have an NIV and you're open there, chapter 10 has the heading, Paul's defense of his ministry. And his defense of his ministry is a reluctant defense because he recognizes at the very end of chapter 10 that it's not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. So he says, it's really not something that I want to do to get into a classification of ministry, my ministry against the ministry of others. He actually says that directly in verse 12, somewhat ironically, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. They're actually writing their own CVs. Uh, they're conducting their own interviews. Uh, they have decided who they are and how wonderful they are. And so Paul says, really, we need to understand that it's not what you say about yourself that matters. What you say about yourself means nothing in God's work. What you say about yourself means nothing in God's work. It's what God says about you that matters. 
That's how he finishes chapter 10. And so he says, if there's any boasting to be done, it mustn't be about personal achievements, but rather it must be about the Lord. And it is the Lord who has been underpinning all that Paul has done all the way through. So that when, for example, in his first letter, he writes concerning success and encouragement in evangelism, in the sowing of the seeds of the gospel, he puts it succinctly and with great humility. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. I did the job of planting, he said, and others did their part. Now, when we reach chapter 11, we discover that his detractors have been boasting, among other things, about their Jewishness and about their servanthood. And that is why, he says in verse 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they the servants of Christ? And then he says, I am out of my mind to talk like this, I am more. Now, when he then goes to the more, what he goes on to describe is his experience of suffering for Christ. He does not list his credentials in terms of the numbers that had emerged to hear him preach. He does not go back through his training with Gamaliel. He does not give a long list of his credentials, but rather he says, and I'm out of my mind to say this, if you want to consider my life and my ministry, then consider it distinctly in terms of inadequacy. And then he goes through his list. Been in prison more frequently, flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again, and all the way through. It's not dissimilar to what he does when he ends his letter in Galatians. He says, I don't want to have any, I don't want really to have any trouble from any of you that I've written to. And he doesn't then say, because you all know how prestigious I am, because you all know that I am the great mighty apostle Paul. No, if you recall, what he says is, I don't really want to have any trouble from you because I bear in my body the marks of Christ. In other words, his credential is a credential of weakness. His appeal is the appeal of a back that has been broken open in the service of Jesus Christ. If there is to be any boasting, he says, let it then be boasting in the Lord. And perhaps to illustrate the very point, uh, at the end of chapter 11, he says, if I'm going to boast, I'll boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I'm not telling lies. And then he says, In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was taken away in a large limousine. But some of my supporters came for me and removed me by a helicopter. No, but I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall, and I slipped through his hands." Not exactly an auspicious departure from Damascus. Could he ever have forgotten the great contrast between the way in which he had proceeded to Damascus in all of the pride of his heart? breathing out threatenings and slaughter against those who name the name of Jesus Christ. And now he leaves, squeezed into a basket, and pushed out through the wall, and scarpering away to safety. Says, wait, it was there that the persecutor became the persecuted. And in that new experience now of persecution, in all of the weakness that unfolds, Paul declares the credentials of his ministry. And so in chapter 12, which of course you are greatly familiar with, uh, he is aware of the fact that the opportunity for boasting concerning the peculiar experience of being caught up into the third heaven 
is a wonderful one. If ever you had an opportunity to brag, uh, to go on the equivalent of Christian TV and let everybody know what had happened to you in those strange moments, it is there for you to do. But he says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to use that as a basis for self-promotion. I'm not going to use that as a platform to set myself forward and make these people know who are my detractors, just how significant I am, and just what I have experienced of God, and all the things that are peculiar to me. He says, I'm not going to do that. I could do that, but I choose not to do that. It's along the lines of his arrival in Corinth, isn't it? First Corinthians 2. When I came to you, loved ones, I didn't come to you with this or with that, not because he was incompetent in the term of his intellectual faculty, but because he recognized the incongruity in the proclamation of a message that was so foolish. There is a lesson in this in passing. Uh, my boss in Edinburgh all those years ago makes a wonderful comment on this. He says, of all the contexts in which boasting is inappropriate, this surely heads the list. Any genuine experience of God is a gift of his love and provides no basis for us to elevate ourselves. So he says, I'm not going to use this as a basis of elevation. And then he explains his thorn in the flesh in terms of God's purposeful intervention in his life. There was given me, verse 7, a thorn in my flesh. This is his theologizing of his experience. It's not our, our jurisdiction here to go into this just now. But the way in which he expresses this is striking. Peterson paraphrases it helpfully. Because of the extravagance of these revelations, and to keep me from getting a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in touch with my limitations. I find that very helpful. Because of the extravagance of the revelations, and to keep me from becoming a fathead, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in touch with my limitations. Says Bengal, how dangerous must self-exaltation be when the apostle required so much restraint. How dreadful must self-exaltation be if the apostle required such restraint, that God intervened in his life at the deepest level of his physicality in order to ensure that he would understand that actually it was in the experience of weakness and inadequacy that his greatest usefulness was to be found. Now, let's finish this first point with just a couple of comments. It is in the confrontation with inadequacy that he discovers that God's grace is sufficient. You will notice that his weakness is not removed. He asked for this thorn in the flesh to be removed. That is not removed. But the weakness becomes the conduit of God's power. And I think verse 10 gives it to us perfectly in that sentence, doesn't it? The paradox of grace. When I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. Here, I suggest to you, is the principle of all effective service. And if I may jump outside of my first point for a moment, and this is why some of us will never amount to anything for God. Because we revolt against this principle. And I'm going to show you in a moment just why we are prone to do so. The glory does not lie in our inadequacy. This is not a plea for going around like Uriah Heep trying to tell everybody, I'm a very humble man, Mr. Copperfield. I am your humble servant, Master Copperfield, if you know David Copperfield. The glory does not lie in our inadequacy, but lies in the adequacy of Christ, which is discovered in our weakness and in our insufficiency. So, Again, Peterson's paraphrase at the end, he says, Now I take limitations in my stride, and with good cheer. These limitations that cut me down to size, and so the weaker I get, the stronger 
I become. Well, there we have it. That's enough on, on the first point. I think instead of my insufficiency proving to be a barrier to usefulness, the reverse is the case. Since dependence is the objective, weakness is the advantage. Secondly, let's look at it in terms of the um, cultural setting in which we read our Bibles and in which we respond to these truths. A culture uh, that, to borrow a phrase from David Wells, has, quotes, a bloated sense of human capacity. A bloated sense of human capacity. In keeping with that assessment, in writing in the Wall Street Journal in July 2009, Peggy Noonan observed in one of her columns, quotes, for 30 years, the self-esteem movement told the young they're perfect in every way. It's yielding something new in history, an entire generation with no proper sense of inadequacy. An entire generation with no proper sense of inadequacy. Those of you who are sociologists will be familiar with the book Therapy Culture, written by a professor from Kent University in the south of England, Frank Fuerdy or Fuerdy. And in that book, he records, at the beginning he has some very uh, helpful uh, graphs, and in one of them he records a search of 300 United Kingdom newspapers in 1980. He searched 300 newspapers looking for a reference to self-esteem. In 1980, they couldn't find a single one. In 1986, they found three citations. By 1990, there were 103. A decade later, in 2000, there were a staggering 3,328 references. Who knows how many there are today, 11 years on. But what we do know today is that living for oneself and feeling good about oneself is increasingly the central and controlling feature of human existence. And such an orientation has no place for thoughts of inadequacy. Because to tolerate such notions works against the absolute essentiality of maintaining a favorable opinion of oneself. Whatever else happens, we must never, ever lose that. It is the key to everything our world tells us. Says Fjordi in his book, Low Self-Esteem is one of the most overused diagnoses for the problem of the human condition. And if you care to read the book, he works it out very helpfully. Earlier this year, around the time of college and university graduation, David Brooks wrote an editorial in the New York Times entitled, It's Not About You. He described the graduates setting off into the world with what he refers to as the baby boomer theology, so often iterated in commencement addresses ringing in their ears. And then he articulates that theology. Follow your passion. Chart your own course. Follow your dreams. Find your self. This, says Brooks, is the litany of expressive individualism, which is still the dominant theme in American culture. Again, quoting him, today's graduates enter a cultural climate that preaches the self as the center of life. But, says Brooks in his concluding sentence, the purpose in life is not to find yourself. It is to lose yourself. Are we going to have to turn to the editorial pages of the New York Times in order to correct the warped theology of contemporary evangelicalism? And we shouldn't assume that this kind of pushback to any realistic, proper sense of inadequacy is a 21st century phenomenon, because it isn't. In 1946, John Sloan, who was then president of Dartmouth College, told the graduating class, quotes, there is nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. In 2010, last year, the current president of Dartmouth, Jim Kong Young Kim, 
referenced the statement from 1946, and then told the graduating class, quotes, you are the better human beings we've all been waiting for. Now, if you found the statement in 46 staggering, what do you make of such a statement in 2010? The starting point for this mentality actually is not high school graduation. It's uh, beginning a lot earlier than that, as those of you who are doing child psychology know. The time when children could relax and be children and fall off their bikes and fail has, has faded into the dim and distant past. Achievement is aspired to from the moment of birth, if not before. William Cohen in the New York Times says, nowadays parents hire tutors to correct the pitching motions of little leaguers. Because the one thing that we couldn't possibly tolerate is for little Freddy to be a failure, or to find out that he has an inadequate little left arm, and he's just going to have to live with it for the rest of his life. Now, you're sensible people. You read the papers. You, you review culture. Every so often a discordant note sounds. Someone introduces the idea of inadequacy or failure as important to usefulness. Someone as significant in Steve, as Steve Jobs in his now legendary graduation speech at Stanford University in 2005. Steve Jobs at least moved in the direction of Paul's perspective when he tied his being fired from Apple at the age of 30 to significant progress in his later life. This is what he said. It turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. Hmm. But actually, that perspective is still more than a Sabbath day's journey away from the biblical framework. Let me give it to you at the most trivial level that I, have, uh, that I have noticed it. This goes back to when I was still a teenager to Bushy in Hertfordshire, the first time that I ever saw an American football game. The, the, the Army, the United States Army, were hosting a team. I hadn't a clue really what was going on, but I stayed there because I liked the girl who had taken me. Still do. She's my wife. <laughs> I believe she still likes me as well. I trust so. But I was, I was struck by the, the, the uniqueness of the game and, the, and these cheerleaders. As a teenager, you would expect me to be struck by the teenagers. But it wasn't how they looked. It was what they said. And they must have said more than this, but they definitely had this as their central cheer. And it went like this. You can do it. You can do it. You can. You can. You can do it. You can do it. You can. You can. The fundamental problem was they couldn't <laughs> because they were annihilated by the army. The army thrashed them. And I remember the score becoming so unbelievable. I'm used to, to football played with your feet, and the score is relatively minor. But they, they were like at 37-3 as the sun began to wane in the sky. But still they were there. You can do it. You can do it. You can. You can. Somebody should have had the courage to say, stop that. <laughs> well, that's enough on the culture. Let's change gears once again and ask the question, where then does the contemporary church fall in relationship to these things? If there is any sense of accuracy in what we're suggesting from the biblical model here as it relates to Paul. And if one's generalizations from the culture hold any water, then would it be fair to say that the church is firmly grounded in its understanding of inadequacy as a foundation for usefulness? Or do you think that the church has capitulated to the spirit of the age, and that the average seminarian is about to launch himself or herself on an unsuspecting church and let them all know how brilliant she is or how terrific he is and how they just can't wait to discover it. 
Now, I'm going to spend less time on this purposefully. I'm also going to put my sentences in the interrogative rather than in the declarative. I am also not going to give specific examples with people's names, and therefore I run the risk of falling down in a morass of generalizations. Having said all of that, by way of disclaimer, let me play my hand. You will recall that when Nehemiah was assigned the task for the rebuilding of the walls and the rehanging of the gates in the broken-down context of Jerusalem, the first thing that he did was pray. Then he did a reconnaissance. And after his reconnaissance, under cover of night and with little fuss and bother, he didn't arrive in Jerusalem under a great banner saying, your greatest fears are over, I am here, Nehemiah has arrived. No, he finally got the people together, and he said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Or in the King James Version, it puts it in the interrogative, do you see the trouble we are in? Well, the fact of the matter was they saw it, but they didn't see it. They had grown accustomed to the trouble that they were in, they had begun to live with it. They were, it was so familiar to them that it took somebody coming from the outside to let them see that the real predicament was not actually in the fact that the walls were broken down, but the broken down walls were a metaphor for the fact that the glory of God was being dragged in the dust of a Judean hillside. And so his prophetic role is to call the people in the midst of the situation to stand back far enough from it for a moment and to view it from the perspective of God, and then to determine what needs to be done from there. And so it is that in every generation, the role of the prophet is in part to say, do you see this? Do you see the trouble we are in? I wonder, are we alert to the way in which our pulpits increasingly sound like popular therapy rather than unpopular theology? Are we aware how little the call of the kingdom rings out? He who would be first should be last. He who would be master of all must be the servant of all. The radical claims of Jesus cutting across the preoccupations of our contemporary society, a narcissistic culture that is intensely interested in feeling good about itself, and the incumbent pressure that is on the pulpit to try and make sure that we do not lose the ears of those whose agenda is so different from Christ's. He is the one who calls for the renunciation of the self. You want to save your life, then lose it. If you lose your life for my sake and the gospel, says Jesus, you will find it. It is in loss that you find it. In trying to hold on to it, you lose it. I wonder, have we embraced such a notion of triumphalism that we are now embarrassed by any notion of inadequacy or insufficiency? We must ask the question why it is that the least, the last, and the left out in our communities, the marginalized, are not coming in droves into the context of our churches. And it may be a simplistic response. It's certainly a generalization, and I understand that. But nevertheless, part of the answer may lie in the fact that we portray ourselves as the company that has it all together, as the company that understands everything, that has got it all buttoned down. And so the person says, well, I daren't go in there and tell people how I really am, because if they find out what I'm really like, none of them are like that at all. Now, because, you see, we're all shiny porcelain 
pictures. It makes it hard for an old cracked pot to nestle in amongst all that shiny stuff. Is it possible that our churches are more akin to Lake Wobegon, the little town that time forgot and the decades cannot improve, where all the women are strong, all the men are good-looking, and all the children are above average? I'm just asking you to think, that's all. Smugness. Evangelical smugness. Such a smugness, such a pervasive smugness, that the smug don't know how smug they are. It will take unsmugness to expose it. Are we prepared to tolerate the thought, the observation again by David Wells, that, quotes, efforts to build character have been replaced by efforts to manage the impressions that we make on others? Efforts to build character are sidelined in a preoccupation with personality. What, what if we are actually focused on the unashamed promotion of ourselves than on the unequivocal proclamation of the gospel? What if we have answered the first question in the shorter Scottish Catechism so many times that we don't realize where we are? What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God. To glorify God. Not to glorify myself. To glorify God. Paul says, if I want to glorify myself, I can run through my credentials any day you want. I went to the right schools. I came from the right family background. I had everything by the tail. But I'm not here to do that. That's why I would all the more gladly glory in my infirmities and in my insufficiencies in order that the transcendent power might be seen to belong to God. You can't have it both ways. You cannot from the pulpit, if I may just illustrate it for me for a moment, you cannot from the pulpit make people believe that you're fantastic and that Jesus is fantastic simultaneously. No, they may look at you and say, you mean a little pipsqueak like that was able to expound that passage? That's amazing. We must have a great God and a great Bible. Is it conceivable that we suffer from humility in the wrong place? Humility in the wrong place. Do you remember how Chesterton on one occasion observed that a man was meant to be doubtful of himself but undoubting about the truth. Doubtful of himself, undoubting about the truth. This has now been exactly reversed. We are producing a crop of preachers who are very sure about themselves and creatively vague about doctrinal orthodoxy. So they're very, very sure about who they are. And they believe that it is the great apologetic to let the world know that they are equally unsure about just everything between the covers of their Bible. It's humility in the wrong place. I think on that occasion, Chesterton said, we are now breeding a group of individuals who are too humble to acknowledge the validity of the three times table. In a strange leap to Ronald Reagan, if you've ever gone to the Reagan Library in Simi Valley and put on the earphones and gone into the mock-up of the Oval Office, you will have heard President Reagan's voice in your ears. And like me, you will have been intrigued by much that is said. And like me, you may have been arrested when he reaches the point and he says, I never regarded this as my own office. 
I regarded this as the office of the people. I served in this office. And then he says, I took it so seriously that I never removed my suit coat when I was working in the Oval Office. And then there's a pause. And he says, you see, you can take the office seriously without taking yourself too seriously. Is it possible that contemporary evangelicalism is increasingly fertilized by those of us who take ourselves too seriously while not taking that to which we've been called seriously enough. That brings me then to my final point, as the, the, the uncomfortable nature of the challenge turns its, turns its gaze uh, on us as individuals. If we consider it in terms of the biblical pattern, and then in terms of the cultural context, and then in terms of, if you like, the ecclesiastical framework, then now what about it personally? It's the challenge to ask ourselves whether we're prepared to face up to our extreme feebleness, to face up to our impotence, to face up to what Jonathan Edwards referred to as, quotes, the bottomless depths of secret corruption and deceit in our hearts. Or are we going to kid ourselves? Are we going to start to believe our own press clippings? Are we going to start to be imbibing some of this elixir that makes it very difficult for your wife to sleep with you in the evening because she can't find a pillow big enough to accommodate your gargantuan cranium <laughs> like a grapefruit on a toothpick? <laughs> Says C.S. Lewis in The Four Loves, Those Like Myself, whose imagination far exceeds their obedience, are subject to a just penalty. We easily imagine conditions far higher than we have actually reached. If we describe what we have imagined, we may make others and make ourselves believe that we have really been there, and so fool both them and ourselves. You see, here is one of the arenas in which we face the danger of allowing the world, the world to squeeze us into its own mold. Many times when we expound Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, uh, it, it has more of a, uh, of a flavor to it of dealing with uh, some of the um, bits and pieces, and often in, 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 a, in a teenager's life. I remember I listened to so many sermons on that. That was all, it was all about a sort of second level of Christianity, and if you wanted to be a missionary, you had to be a Romans 12, 1 and 2 Christian. But if you just wanted to be a Christian, you didn't really have to worry about it very much. I hope we're all saved from that. But what is striking to me is that after he says, this is your service of reasonable worship, what is the very first point of application? Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. He starts right there with humility. You offer your body as a living sacrifice to God, your mind, your influence, all that you have, all of your training, all of your studies, all of your everything. You offer it all up to God, which is your reasonable service of spiritual worship. Then immediately says, now listen, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather with sober judgment. Let's think about pastor just for a moment. Let's turn the gaze where it's most uncomfortable, the searchlight that shines right in my eyes that I cannot avoid. As pastors and church leaders, we have to ask ourselves whether we can honestly say with Paul, we do not preach ourselves. 2 Corinthians 4 5. We do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. Can we really say we do not preach ourselves? Let me tell you, we preach ourselves when we seek to advance our reputation, our influence, and our own well-being. We preach ourselves when our pulpits become the occasion of conjecture and personal opinion rather than the exposition of the text. We preach ourselves when we intrude continually with stories about ourselves or attempts 
to display our cleverness. The commentator Barnes puts it simply when he says, we preach ourselves in one word when self is primary and the gospel is secondary, when we prostitute the ministry to gain popularity, to live a life of ease, to be respected, to gain influence, to rule over people, and to make the preaching of the gospel merely an occasion of advancing ourselves in the world. So we need to pray, don't we, that God in His mercy will do whatever it takes in order to drive home to our hearts the reality of our insufficiency. Until we know, not just intellectually, but experientially, that Jesus meant what He, what he said when He told His followers, apart from me, you can do nothing. We're in real difficulty. Sir Malcolm Sargent, the fellow who's responsible for creating the tedium at high school graduations when a half-baked orchestra plays ad nauseum. Um, dum, dum, da, da, dum, dum, dum. That's Sargent. We have him to thank for that. On one occasion, he's listening to a very fine singer. The girl is a soprano. She is singing an operatic piece. She is apparently flawless in her technique. The clarity of her tone is exceptional. She finishes to great applause. And the person who had taken Sir Malcolm Sargent to the occasion turned to him and said, So what do you think? He said, I think she will be brilliant when something happens to break her. when something happens to break her heart. You see, fellas, girls, what Paul is displaying here is a reliance on Christ alone for life and power. To rely on Christ for life and for power demands that I seek to rely upon myself, that I renounce my confidence in any of my own wisdom and my own willpower. And I turn entirely to Christ, asking Him for the wisdom and power that is needed. You can do the research on your own now. We started in Corinthians with Paul. We might easily have gone to the psalmist, Psalm 127 unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stands guard in vain. In other words, we build and we watch in vain apart from the Lord. Solomon, call out, he says to his son, call out for wisdom, call out for these things. In other words, pray, seek God, ask him for this insight. Joseph, I hear, says Pharaoh, that you are an interpreter of dreams. I had a particularly bad night last night. Can you help me? What does he say? You've come to the right man. Boy, if there was ever anybody that knew about dreams, it's me. I've done a couple of books on dreams, and uh, I have a CD series as well. I, uh, I've got to run off at the moment. I'm doing an interview, but I could leave you a CD and you blah. No. What does he say? I cannot, but God can. I cannot, but God can. What was Joseph saying there? Was he saying he was irrelevant? No. He was a conduit. He wasn't the key. This is not some call to passivity. This is not some old-fashioned, you know, early 20th century, let go and let God notion. I'm not even approaching that. I'm a thousand miles away from that. I cannot, but God can. Or what about the leadership of Jehoshaphat when he assembles all the people together in the square and somebody comes and says, there's a vast army coming against you. It will annihilate us. Jehoshaphat said, you don't know who you're dealing with. I'm Jehoshaphat. I mean, <laughs> did he? No. He called out to God. Oh, God, he says, we do not know what to do 
but our eyes are upon you. We have no power to face this vast army coming against us. Do you find that in any leadership books lately? Wall Street today has a number of principles of how you're supposed to be a successful leader. I guarantee you this isn't one of them. The one thing you don't do is stand up in front of the congregation and say, I don't know what to do. We're completely overwhelmed. That's Jehoshaphat. No surprise, because God, Isaiah 40, gives strength to the weak. Full circle to Paul. God chose the weak, he says, 1 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 4, he put his treasure in old clay pots. In old clay pots. There you are, Trinity graduate. Take that big diploma, put it up on the wall, and have your wife or your mom or your girlfriend or somebody just draw a picture of an old flower pot that's kind of cracked and musty and put that up beside it just to remind yourself that that's what you are. Because even the Christians we admire most for their godliness and for their giftedness are just as much jars of clay as are we. Brother, will you give me that little book that's there? Sir? Yeah, just throw that to me. Thank you. The people that we admire the most are as much jars of clay as ourselves. This is, this is Stoddy just before he dies. Someone says to him, Stott, what about you? What are you? This is what he said. I am simply a beloved child of a heavenly Father, an unworthy servant of my friend and master, Jesus Christ, a sinner saved by grace to the glory and praise of God. How do you explain Stott's usefulness? Because he got a double first from Oxford? Because he's arguably the best sanctified scholarship brain in a pulpit? in the 20th century? No, I don't think so. I think you'd have to explain him in terms of his willingness to accept that all that God had given him still brought him to the place where he realized, apart from you, Jesus, I can do nothing. And then we will finish with Augustine. Augustine says, when anyone knows that he is nothing in himself and has no help from himself, the weapons within him are broken and the war is ended. When anyone knows he's nothing in himself and has no help from himself, the weapons are broken and the war is ended. But unfortunately, the war never ends, does it? I haven't found the war ends. That's why I like the Westminster Confession. It says the Christian is involved in a continual and irreconcilable war. It never ends. And so it is to the gospel that we have to turn to remind ourselves that Christ bore the sins of our proud adequacy in himself, that he clothes us with the garments of his righteousness, and that it is this unmerited grace that stirs us and enables us to press on to the gates of heaven. But says Rutherford, you must remember, be humbled, walk softly, down with your top sail, stoop, stoop. It is a low entry to go in at heaven's gate. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Father, we offer ourselves afresh to you. We pray that under the searching gaze of your word and in obedience to the direction of the Holy Spirit, you might be pleased to use the considerations of the last hour to help us live our lives to the praise of your glorious grace. And this we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. About uh, 30 minutes uh, for uh, questions, and uh, uh, Alistair Begg would be glad to respond to them. Uh, you can make your way up to uh, one of the two mics on either side. 
Uh, and uh, as you do that, let me uh, maybe begin um, an, an, an application, uh, and it's coming from two ends. One, the younger person uh, who probably here anyway wouldn't disagree with anything you've said about the humility and, and the importance of that. But what counsel would you give him or her who knows this mostly doctrinally or abstractly? On the other side, those that have been in ministry for a number of years and they have the experience and they've been there, done that, figured it out, you can engage in ministry and you hardly even have to pray about it anymore. What counsel would you give to that person? Well, to the, to the second person, I'd say look out. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're now at our most dangerous mm-hmm. when, we, when we find ourselves in that predicament. You know, one of the verses that scares me most is, uh, the, you know, the final phrase where Paul says, the day will bring it to light. Mm-hmm. The idea of ministry that is represented either by gold and silver and precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble. And the, the, the paralyzing thought that we may be engaged from our perspective in a very sort of spectacular ministry, but in actual yes. fact, it isn't. In both cases, we need, we need examples, don't we? And we need good friends. Um, often, um, you know, an elderly Irish guy once said to me that, you know, a minister needs a wife if for no other reason than just to keep him humble. But those who live with us uh, know us, and they will be quick to detect those things. And it's, it's very important that they're, that they're willing to speak into our lives. In terms of the young person, I, I, I think I would say, hang on, you know. It, you're, um, it, you know, the, something will catch you along the way here. I just believe it for the... T- fly, fly the instruments for the yeah. moment. Believe it when they tell you in flight school that uh, it can get phenomenally turbulent, you know, because one day it will, and when it does, it will be good that you have already got to this point in your thinking. Um, and I think also reading to the young person, saying, uh, you know, reading, reading good Christian biographies is a big help as well. They realize, you know, uh, uh, you take a guy like uh, William Carey, you know, who is a who's a shoemaker, you know, says, goes, to the, goes to those uh, fellows and says that he wants to evangelize India. <laughs> and they told him, you can't evangelize India, you're a shoemaker. You're completely inadequate. The Gladys Sailward, same thing. I want to go to China. They told him, you can't go to China. You're too small, you're too dumb, and you're too frail. History reveals that in her smallness and in her frailty, And with that little person that God had made her, with that very long black hair, which she often thought was a point of inadequacy because she'd like to have been taller and blonder, when she finally reached China, she realized, oh God, you do know what you're doing. You made me tiny with very black hair so that I might become the little woman who was used in the lives of countless children. It was what she regarded as her inadequacy, which was really the foundation of her usefulness. The clay pot. Yep. Um, here, please. What would you, um, is this on? Yeah. What would you say to uh, a lay person who hasn't had any theological training officially or something like that, um, that has a desire to serve the Lord but feels they don't have the training or the skills or gifts in order to do so? Um, I'd say a couple of things. I'd say, first of all, I'm glad that you have the desire. You know, the Bible says that he who that desires the, uh, the, the task of an, of an overseer or of, a, or of an elder desires, desires a noble thing. And so that uh, the this, this sense of aspiration on the one hand and fearfulness on the other is a happy tension in which I think that that, that sense of, uh, of engagement comes. Um, you know, I... I hope nobody takes from what I'm saying that this is some kind of uh, diatribe against, you know, uh, being as trained, as well-trained as we possibly can be, because it, I'd be an idiot to come to, you know, a place, an institution like this, and, um, and, and, and try and, and, and suggest that. Um, 
so I, I would actually say to somebody like yourself, well, if, if you do feel yourself uh, inadequate, let's say you're going to be a small group leader, there are ways in which you can uh, develop those things. And there are, you know, for example, in an institution like this, there are night classes, and you find someone who's doing a survey of, uh, of Scripture, and there's a class for eight weeks or ten weeks, I would say go to that, get that. But at the same time, I would say remember that, um, you, you know, you, you, it's not... Um, it, you, can, you can do all of that and, and, and still not be peculiarly useful to God. You know, it is, it is, in, the, it is in the very heart of things. So we, what we're really looking for is sanctified scholarship. I mean, we're looking for people who are giving themselves uh, and doing the best that they can do in thinking everything out. And as a layman, it's not the same as, as uh, others who have those privileges. But some of the most influential people in my own life have been Christian laymen who are then, especially for youngsters, uh, models of somebody who actually has a proper job but loves Christ, you know, who is an engineer but also is committed to the Scriptures, who serves, uh, you know, in a, in a biochemical lab, and yet he, he's uh, so clearly teaching the Bible. So what I'd want to do is encourage an individual like that to... Read as, read as extensively as they can uh, to seek out opportunities that are available to them so as to be thoroughly equipped, you know? Thoroughly equipped. Be as equipped as you can be. Thank you. When we graduate and we're looking for positions, maybe a pastoral ministry position, a lot of times we're, we're asked to promote ourselves in, in a sense, or it feels like it, send in your your best sermon, send in your, your resume. How do we go about that pursuit while guiding, uh, guarding ourselves, I guess, from, from starting to feel more adequate than we ought? <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. I just stopped myself from saying, you know, I'm growing weary getting those kind of letters. And, um, you know, where, the, where the, you get a letter from the person says, I'm X years old, I've done this and I've done that. Uh, I believe I need to be in a, in a multiple staff church in a context such as A, B, C. You know, they're very, very clear about uh, who they are, what they are, and what they need to be doing because somebody's told them that's really what you need to do. Um, I, 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 I mean, I, there's, a, there's a process that there has to be. I understand that. And maybe some people really like that kind of thing. Um, I, I don't know how to make it all happen, but... I think that the value of, you know, getting in, getting, in some, getting in somewhere to begin and to work some of those things out in the process, whether it's in an internship or whatever it might be, is, um, is, is probably really, really helpful. Um, when, when, I, when I played football for my school, I was good, but I wasn't really good. And so what happened was every Friday you had to go to the science lab, and you sat in the science lab surrounded by all those egg smells. And the, and the, and the coach came in and threw the, threw the jerseys out at the people that were picked to play that Saturday. And you didn't know until he started throwing the jersey whether you were getting a jersey and what number was on your jersey. Some people were, you know, sort of obvious picks. I wasn't. I just sat there going, give me a jersey. I'll play anywhere you want me to play. I'm so desperately keen to play. I'll do anything you want me to do. Just give me a jersey. And that's what I'm looking for in young guys. Just give me a jersey. You know, I'm... I, I, I'm not a specialist. I'm, not, I, I, you know, I, I, I have an interest here. And just give me a jersey. So if someone writes me a note and says, "Hey, I, my name is Joe. Give me a jersey." Then I'll know they heard this talk, and then I'll have, <laughs> then I'll have to talk to them. Is that a decent? I don't know. If that's a good or a bad answer. Anyway, that's the answer. If I wouldn't I, listen to those people that tell you to blow your horn, though. I don't do. I, I wouldn't do that. I'd undersell myself. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do that. If I could follow up, as you're, yeah, please. Uh, you've you've started uh, an initiative with interns. 
uh, talk about that a little bit. Is that is that part of what you're saying here? Yeah, it is here? in part. It is in part. Yeah. Um, you know, one of your graduates, a couple of your graduates are with us, Scott Kennedy and, uh, and uh, Josh Griswold. And uh, actually, Bing Nay was, was with us before he reached you. So he's kind of a reverse play. But um, I really can't take much credit for it except wanting to see it happen. The fellows that are making it happen know what they're doing. I don't really know. In fact, the three newest interns this summer I had no part in their, um, in their um, invitation. And that was a real stretch for me, being a control freak. But it was an important thing for me to, to do. And th there are three really fine fellows. One from Wheaton, one from Taylor, and one from uh, Malone College nearby. And... Um, the, the, our plan is just to keep these fellows. They, they don't know what we're doing is we're trying to help them determine whether whether um, pastoral ministry has a place in their future. So we're doing the kind of um, a, a kind of gap year in between undergraduate and postgraduate, and uh, and it's, we're in the infancy of it. We're really walking in the dark with our hands out in front of us, but it's proving very beneficial, I think, to us as a church. And I think from the report of the three guys that left in the summer, it was a worthwhile exercise. And it allows, it allows the, the person to get a feel for things without uh, being, um, being hidebound by it. Yeah. Over here, please. Hi, uh, my Hello. name's Michael, and uh, I'm in my last year at Trinity, and I know one thing that me and several um, brothers um, just have been kind of wrestling through is the question of, how do you, on one hand, hold this idea of, of inadequ uh, inadequacy and recognizing that? And yet, on the other hand, I think there can be a, a danger we felt of like, we so want to avoid pride or putting right. ourselves forward that there can almost be a passivity. And how do you think through about, say, if you're going to do a church plant, like how do you say, hey, you know, we're all inadequate, but this guy seems a little more gifted to lead. Let's, let's kind of run with that. Like, how do you balance kind of those those things without falling in either ditch. Do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it really is the question, isn't it? I mean, I, um, yeah, because even the whole sort of inadequate thing, that's why I mentioned Uriah Heep. I didn't get much response from that. I, I guess you haven't been reading Charles Dickens lately, but uh, um, it's just a sort of glazed stare by people going, who? It's, uh, I don't know who is it? Uh, but um, the benefit of a Scottish education. Um, but... Uh, yeah, because we can get ourselves into the position where, you know, we're phenomenally proud about how inadequate we are. Um, you know, I'm more inadequate than you. Um, um, and so, so it becomes a, a ridiculous thing. Um, no, I mean, it, what, what Paul is saying is, I'm not sufficient for this, but I am God's man. And therefore, because I am God's man, and because he's chosen to use weakness as a conduit for strength, I'm going to give myself to this, you know, wholeheartedly. And, you know, if, if you think about Paul's ministry, he was accused of all kinds of things. And, it, you know, and at one point he says, I don't care if I'm judged by you or by any human court. In other words, he's getting a lot of detractors who says, I don't, I don't care if I'm judged. That sounds really kind of bullshit, doesn't it? I mean, that sounds a little... At himself. I don't care if I'm judged by you or by any human court. He says, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear. And then he says, but that doesn't make me innocent. In other words, he knows his, he knows his own heart. And so it is that tension, and we live in that tension. The tension of, as I said to the other fellow, as aspiring to something that is clearly beyond us. And yet, and yet at the same time recognizing that, that God, throughout history, ha has chosen to use those who understood themselves to be insufficient for the vastness of the task. I mean, I mean, hey, um, how how are you doing, Gideon? Oh, not bad for a little guy. Um, well, who are you, Gideon? Well, I come from a little group. I've, I've got a family, and I'm I'm the least. I'm I'm the least in my family. Just the man I'm looking for. 
we got a honking big army up here that's going to destroy you guys, and you're my man. What? Jeremiah? Interested in doing a little prophesying? No, I'm, I'm, I'm a child. I can hardly put sentences together. Jeremiah, you're my man. Do you have anybody that I could anoint as king here? No, 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 no. Anyone else? Well, we got one other one, but he's never around. He's out running around in the fields, rolling around, playing with sheep and everything. Well, bring him in. You're my man. The armies are arraigned against Goliath. Proud in their sufficiency until the cheese boy comes, the pizza boy, <laughs> Domino's. Here he comes. And the Domino's boy goes, I could kill that sucker. <laughs> and his brother says, you, You're so proud, you came down here just to watch the battle. <laughs> I, I, I want to rewrite the Bible where David goes, What battle? You know. <laughs> It doesn't say that in there, but that's what he ought to say. What do you mean I came to watch the battle? There is no battle. Because none of you are pretty, none of you. What was the problem? What was the problem? What was it that made it possible for David? David says, you defy the armies of the living God. It was about the glory of God. He saw what they didn't see. They just saw a big giant. And none of them was brave enough to take him on. He saw that the glory of God was being besmirched by this ugly big character. And because his zeal was for the glory of God, he despised all the accoutrements of Saul's armor, which must have been an amazing picture in the family room with him going around with that stuff on. And he went out there confident in the God who had done for him what he couldn't do for himself when he met the bear and when he met the lion. He didn't say of course I'm the right man. You should see some of, the, some of the trophies I have on my wall. I've killed things with my bare hands. That's not what he's saying. He says, the God who delivered me from the bear and the lion, the God who did for me what I couldn't do, left to myself, he will deliver this ugly Philistine into my hands, and I will cut off his head and then the armies of Israel and the armies of the Philistines will know that there is a God in heaven. Not that they will know how fantastic is this little shepherd pizza delivery boy. That's the tension, loved ones. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what it is. That's why McShane says, what a man is on his knees before God, that is what he is and nothing else. I don't know what you think of me. I can't worry about what you think of me. Big, fat, small, tall, daft, stupid, whatever it is. I can't worry about it. I worry about the fact of the motives of my heart. For that I will be judged. Not whether it was a good talk or a bad talk, but why I even agreed to give the talk in the first place. And why I preach four times a Sunday. That's the tension. That's the tension. Any more? Yes, here. Obviously, one characteristic of thriving churches would be humble leadership. Have you ever, have you noticed any other commonalities of, of thriving churches? Oh, commonalities of thriving, thriving churches, uh, well, yeah, a, a really uh, a united leadership under, 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 under uh, the uh, real understanding that Christ is the chief shepherd. Yes, I mean, that, that there. A, a united leadership, it, uh, but also a, a united in a sense of genuine dependence upon God. The, the idea that... Um, 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 it, it, as, you, as you have in Acts, you know, where it says again and again that the word, that the word of the Lord was spreading, and, and a sense of unity at the level also of, 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 of purpose. You know, in, in Acts, 
you have all those summary statements, as you know. And one of my favorites is the 31st verse of Acts 9, where it says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was, this is, this is after the conversion of Saul, it was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Um, it, it's, it's actually, um, I think the word there is oikodomia. It was, it was built up. It was edified. And in turn, it was multiplied. So that this, this pattern of edification and multiplication, I think, is, a, is, a, is one of the hallmarks that I've noticed of churches in all different kinds of contexts, where although their contexts may be different, that they, that they are seeking to um, do just that, to, to recognize that under the Holy Spirit that the, that the people of God under our care are to be built up in their faith, and that there is almost an, uh, there's an overspill factor that's related to that, that uh, they were encouraged and they grew in numbers as they, as they lived in the fear of the Lord. Um, unity of, of, of purpose and, uh, and, and also the, 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 um, the, the, aw- the awareness, if you like, of, of the priesthood of all believers, you know, that, the gift, that God has poured out His gifts upon His people so that, that, there, that there is the encouragement there in these churches for people to discover you know, who and what they are within the, within the family of God, and then for leadership to enable those people to become catalysts for engagement and involvement. And then, I'll say one last thing, a commitment to both good news and to good deeds. You know, the, the Titus passages, all the three chapters of Titus, where Paul is saying to Titus, you know, it's very important that your people are eager to do good, that they're eager to do good, teach them to do good. And so, th- this combination of, of good news by way of proclamation and good deeds by way of, you know, engagement. Right here, please. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you, do you have any thoughts about how we can um, learn to develop this sense of in- inadequacies, but uh, in a way that will also help us to uh, develop zeal for doing God's work and develop our uh, the gift that we have. Mm-hmm. These are good questions, and I and I'm just standing here thinking about them. I don't have. I I, I hope the very inadequacy of my answers helps to speak to the issue for us. You know, the danger, in, the danger in an address like this is that it can appear to be so dreadfully lopsided. I mean, that, that is part of the value of it in, in one sense, that, that you put it out there because you recognize that, you know, the, the, the counterbalance needs to be there. Um, if I understood your, your, your question correctly, it was along the lines of, okay, if I'm prepared to acknowledge inadequacy, how do I balance that with a zeal for... Um, fulfilling my calling and doing what I believe God has enabled me to do. I misunderstood the question. He's coming back. Sorry. I mean, it was kind of the second half of the question. Uh, but my concern is how do we develop this sense of inadequacies? How do you develop a sense of yeah, inadequacy? Mostly, and how do you develop it? But at the same time, how do you develop faithfulness in doing what you're called to do? Okay, how do you develop a sense of it? How does the inadequacy develop and how does the faithfulness to the calling develop? Probably simultaneously. I mean, for me, the, um, I mean, how would you develop a sense of inadequacy with a golf club? You know, take a golf club and try and hit 10 balls the same distance to the same target one after another. You say, I'm inadequate for that. Okay, well, how about one target and one ball? I'm inadequate for that as well. I love golf. I'm an inadequate golfer. 
maybe I could do more, be more faithful, and then I would become more adequate. Yeah. Okay, so now I can hit four balls to the target. But that's still six that I missed. But it's better than I was. So that our reach always exceeds our grasp. For me, if, if, if the articulation of the good news, if the, the responsibility of teaching the gospel is my primary gift and calling, I am painfully aware of my own inadequacy. I'm 59 years old. When I started off as a 23-year-old in Charlotte Chapel in Edinburgh, and, and I got my first responsibility to teach from the pulpit, I was absolutely tyrannized, you know? I was, I, after about three minutes, I couldn't get any saliva in my mouth. I was, it was like the worst experience I've, I've ever had. And the next time wasn't much better than that. And, and, I was, and I had a little brown box room that I had to put these sermons together in. And, and then I, I, I didn't, didn't have any sermons. Then I thought, well, I could use Alan Redpath's sermons, who was an old guy that had a lot of alliterated outlines. So I had to crack a couple of his, you know, and they were no good either. They were good when he did them, but not when I did them. That made sense, so I learned that lesson fast. We, we learn by doing, but the further we go, you know, I used to think by the time I got to 59, I'd be pretty well done with most of the bad stuff. You know, like I, I saw older people say, you know. Now I realize what McShane was saying, that the seeds of every sin known to man are in my miserable heart. And that although, you know, although we may be making progress, I say to people all the time, I don't know whether I'm making progress as a result of grace, or as a result of just getting old. You know, is the reason I don't react as fast is not because I'm, I'm more humble and gracious, it's just because I'm slowing down, you know? And so then I have to think about that while I'm driving in the car, and then that makes me miserable as well. But, you know, in, in, I, I, I tell you, it's, you just have to, uh, It is in that tension. It is in that tension. When I am weak, then I am strong. That is the paradox of the thing. So if our quest is finally to become strong, to be able to stand up in front of any group, to be able to articulate anything, to be able to do all those things and just, just feel like, hey, wonderful, then we, we can probably get there. But at what expense? Because it is, in the, it is in the inadequate factor, it is in the brokenness factor that the, that the, that the real gain is made. It's, not, it's a horrible answer to your question, brother, I'm sorry. But it, 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 what you're pointing out is the very tension. And I think it is in that paradox. And that in trying to get beyond the weakness part to the strong part, we get, we get beyond where we always need to be which is constantly to be, to be, to be there. Yeah. We've got one here and one here. And then and we're then, done. And then we're done. So then, Steve, if you would be kind of to close us after this final question over here. Thank you. I have to be able to see you and to see everyone else. Someone uh, told me that you were here today, and I remembered your name, and I remembered your accent, which I like a lot, so I came. While I was sitting there, I started to weep as you were describing um, what is happening in the church, the leadership in the church, um, and the cost to the church. That has been my experience. I have been in leadership in the church for 30 years, and I have a passion that has not gone away because I have children, I have grandchildren, and my question is, who's going to parent? Who's going to pastor? Who is going to be equipped to pastor my children, my grandchildren? I also am 59. My childhood 
was awful, and so there's a lot of recovery I've been doing about that. For me, there's not an issue at all about whether or not I have a problem with pride or arrogance. That is, that's just plain not an issue for me. If anything, my question is, who is going to give me a jersey? Who is going to look at me and say, yeah, not only the pastoring that you've done has been so fruitful, but the answers that God is bringing to you, how God is healing you, we, we want you. We want you to be there for our kids, for the next generation. So that's a question I'm asking. Okay. Do I have a place or not? Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course you do. Um, you know, the old, the old uh, Anglican thing, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do, and what I ought to do, with God's help, I will do. Uh, the sphere of our influence differs, varies, uh, within the context of the church. Um, we, we, we need just to, to find our niche. I can't speak to that in relationship to you. But I would say that in relationship to the children and to the grandchildren, I am a grandfather of two little girls. Um, I'm th thoroughly excited about what's happening at Parkside Church in relationship to that because of the selflessness of people like yourself and others who are taking very seriously uh, what it means to, to instill into the lives of these tiny ones, both by song and by poem and by memorization and in, in many ways in sort of classical ways, um, the, the, the truths of the gospel. And the commitment to these young men that I was speaking about earlier, these, the, these young fellows that are just, I spoke with on Sunday night, they are new interns, they are, the oldest of them is six years younger than my youngest child. So I am intensely committed to working myself out of a job and to seeing the 2 Timothy 2 thing actually taking place. And to the extent that churches are committed to that, and to the extent that grandparents are committed to doing, doing the job with their grandchildren, and, and, and uh, the, the Shema of Deuteronomy 6 is in operation, then, then we, need, we needn't be unduly alarmed. I need to remind ourselves every day when we wake up that the Lord God omnipotent reigns. It doesn't always seem so, but it is so. And that uh, nothing's out of control and nothing's going to be out of control. Given the tendency in America to have celebrities in ministry and books and speaking tours and internet sites that are engaging and all the self-aggrandizing things that go on, would you comment on how America compares with other countries and the Christian leadership and what's going to happen to us? Will I'm curious, do you think America will repent before we go down? Well, America does everything better than any other country that I've been in, including getting things wrong. So, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna get it wrong, it will be better at getting it wrong than you. In other words, I mean, this, this, the, the, the privileges of, of, of American life have made it possible for America to do things that no other nation in the world has been able to do and continues to do in terms of world missions, in terms of uh, the establishing of, of the cause of the gospel, and that continues to be the case. I'm actually, I am, I think my last comment should be this comment, I mean the one I just made, and that is that I'm constantly um, glad to be alive at this moment in history. I'm, I'm not remotely concerned about, quotes, America going down, because I'm thoroughly convinced that, Amer that God has no favored nation status for America. Therefore, I can stop worrying about that in the same way that I can stop worrying about Great Britain. Um, so what I, what I can focus on is the fact that um, God is working His purpose out 
as year succeeds to year, that he is putting together a company that no one can number from every tribe, nation, people, and language throughout the world, that what is happening in his world is happening under his jurisdiction, that he is the ascended Christ. At the moment in heaven, he is overseeing the affairs of the nations. And in the overseeing of the affairs of the nations, including this nation, he has never once made a mistake, and he never will. And therefore, I can sleep at night confident that the God who reigns supreme in the heavens has got my concerns, children's concerns, grandchildren's concerns, nation's concerns under, under his control. As to the celebrity thing, um, yeah, I, I, that is a, I, I do believe that there is, a huge, there is a huge danger represented in that. Every, I've been here now 28 years, and every single pastoral collapse of significance that we have seen is traced to the exact same root, and that is, in one word, pride. Pride. Whether it's the homosexuality of one or whether it's the whatever it is of the other. It's, it's, it's the Tiger Woods phenomenon. The rules no longer apply to me. And we must, we must uh, root that out of our own sinful hearts. Pastor Beck, thank you very much for, I think, a wonderfully helpful lecture this afternoon. Before I close this in prayer, I'd call your attention to upcoming events sponsored by the Henry Center. You can find those listed in these three pieces of literature on the back tables out there. It also, of course, appears at our website, which is www.henrycenter.org. I just would call your attention to the debate tomorrow evening between Dr. Moeller and Dr. Wallace concerning social justice. This card will tell you about the scripture seminar lectures that will be coming up in the spring. And the blue one has information on the Jonathan Edwards Center sponsored by the Henry Center and its upcoming activities as well. So God bless you. Thank you for coming. Allow me please to close us briefly in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, this lecture, this sermon by Pastor Begg this afternoon has been a means of grace in our lives. Convicting grace, other kinds of grace, but God, because it has come from you through him, through your word, we give you thanks for it and pray that you would cause it by the power of your Holy Spirit to work deeply in each of our hearts, that which God you have sent it forth to do in each of our hearts. We give you thanks, Lord, that your word is so clear in Isaiah 66, 2, that the one upon whom you look is the one who is humble and contrite in spirit, the one who trembles at your word. And so, Father, we would pray as we close this afternoon that by your grace, in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, you would enable us to be the kind of people who are humble and contrite in spirit, and who, O oh God, tremble before your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.